so often wild animals are the casualties of our human existence. Killed for profit. Their habitats under threat, made to live in cramped spaces, poorly fed. They're destined to live out their lives in misery unless someone takes action. Wild Animal Rescue follows the people from the international animal welfare charity Four Paws as they go on daring and sometimes dangerous rescue missions to give animals a better life. In this episode, a drama-packed mission flying six tigers from the Netherlands to South Africa. First, a medical emergency. Have you got it, Followed by hijinks on the tarmac. And then, the challenges of treating lions with medical problems. Let the lion out. Oh. Frisia is a province in the northwest of the Netherlands. Agriculture and farming are the main industries here. Horses and livestock dot the landscape. It's certainly not where you'd expect to come across tigers, lions and panthers. This fairly ordinary looking rural property is the Felida Big Cat Center, housing 20 large predatory cats that have been rescued from locations all over Europe. This is uh, Cromwell and he came from Dartmoor Wildlife Center in the UK. He ended up in the center here after the Dartmoor Wildlife Center turned out to have unsafe enclosures. That was in 2002. The owner of the center was charged with illegally breeding Siberian tigers and keeping them in poor conditions. Cromwell settled in nicely and mated with another tiger here called Juno. They had two litters and out of the first litter only uh, Rasputin survived. And he is uh, luckily a very healthy big tiger. And the second litter is two males and one female. They're called uh, Mirza, Rafik and Sita. Cromwell and Juno and their four cubs have continued to live at the center, even through a period when the center was struggling to survive. Originally called Pantera, it was founded in the early 90s as a shelter for big cats born in captivity. Many were retired circus cats that would otherwise have been put down. But a few years ago, Pantera came under financial pressure and the enclosures began to fall into disrepair. I met you know, in Cromwell 10 years ago and um, I, could, um, I couldn't get them out of my mind. The, the way that they were kept, the darkness, the coldness, the, the smell, everything was, was just terrible. And I just couldn't get them out of my mind. In 2013, Four Paws took over the center and carried out maintenance and improvements to bring it up to scratch. An important part of daily life for the animals of Felida is what's known as enrichment, activities which help to keep the animals physically and mentally stimulated. If you look to especially predators in uh, captivity, you can see that uh, their environment is not stimulus for them, so they don't see any new things. And through enrichment, they can get their feeling that they're being in the wild, they have the new smells, they can hunt. Physical props which provide enrichment can be cardboard boxes, balls, watermelons, or for the more sophisticated tiger, designer label perfume. This is just a normal perfume, but uh, the smell is pretty intense. And when the animals look to, uh, around in their enclosure, it's like they walking around in their own territory. And if they smell a different smell in the territory, they want to mark the smell. So that's why they get really interested in different smells in the enclosures. It's called flaming in Dutch. They uh, put up their lips and try to scent in the air. So they have a special organ here and they can smell better with that organ. Despite all the enrichment activities and improvements made to the enclosures, the long-term plan is to move most of the big cats to places where they have more space and will be more stimulated. Cromwell, Juno and their four offspring are the next to be moved, but it's going to be a massive journey, all the way to Four Paws flagship wildlife sanctuary, Lions Rock, in South Africa. In South Africa, they get the space they need, they get all the facilities they need, they've got the trees they can climb in, they've got the nice weather, they've got the pools where they can swim because tigers love to swim. And unfortunately, we can't give it uh, to them here in the Netherlands. 
the veterinary team have arrived. Experts in wildlife medicine, they have the important task of tranquilizing the animals in order to move them into their travel crates. Normally, they'd do a pre-anesthetic check on any animal that's going to be sedated. But with tigers being dangerous animals, that's not possible. There's an element of risk with this procedure. Their mobile clinic needs to be ready for any emergencies. The flight to Johannesburg is scheduled for 11 p.m. It's a two-hour drive to the airport where there'll be inspections and documentation, which could take quite a while to clear. They can't afford any delays. We do two animals at the same time because we have the luxury that we have enough veterinarians here around, so to keep the procedure as, as short as possible. We are working with dangerous animals, of course, and with dangerous drugs, so safety first. Safety for the animals and safety for all the people. Frank is responsible for the safety of the team, and he's not entirely comfortable. To be honest, the cages uh, doesn't look really promising. Eh? No. no. The enclosures are not really 100% safe, and we have to cross the public uh, areas here. So a lot of people around. It's not the best situation working with dangerous animals. So that's the reason why we take uh, especially more than 100% precautions. Frank and his team estimate the weight of each animal and carefully calculate the dosages required to sedate them. They are the biggest ones, so calculate 170, 160, she's 110. Anesthetizing large carnivores is a risky business with plenty of opportunity for things to go wrong. It's quite important to have the right dose for the anesthesia, of course, so now we're going to prepare each individual dart for every animal. The vets use a gas-propelled gun to dart the tigers. The first to be tranquilized is Rafiq. The dart must hit a large muscle for the needle to lodge and correctly release the drugs. Next is brother Mirza. The anesthesia will only last around half an hour, giving the staff a short window of time when it's safe to handle the animals. It takes around 10 minutes for the drugs to take effect. The team follows strict safety procedures, only entering the enclosure once the vets have given the okay. You're too big? <laughs> I'm a big guy, huh? Take it out this one. The first priority is to start monitoring the tigers to make sure they're responding okay to the drugs. But the small size of these holding cages is making the job very awkward. He's lying also just in front of the door. Nice. Rafiq is stable, but Mirza's responses are causing concern. She's really relaxed, huh? Yes, she's. Breathing is not. It's not as good. So we uh, get the oxygen. Braucht du Pram hier? Sorry, I need to go to the end. Milliliter? Five milliliter. Adrenaline? Yeah. Hat er keine Reaktion? Nein. Mirza has gone into cardiac arrest and needs a drug to get his heart beating again. Next, what are they trying to do to this lion? Come, 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 come. And Mirza's life is hanging in the balance. Come, we must give him an antidote. Geben. Our Four Paws team is moving six adult tigers from the Netherlands to South Africa. But Mirza, one of the first tigers to be sedated, has gone into cardiac arrest. The situation is critical. This one? Yeah. If you? If you? Between 20 and 80, it's going up and down. Okay. It's back. Yeah. So we load him first. Yeah. Quick. Ich höre nichts gerade. Hang on, hang on. Komm, wir müssen ihm ein Antidot geben. Lass uns ihn raustragen. Okay. Antidot fertig machen, ja. Okay, you ready? Mirza is still very unstable. 
The team desperately need to get him into the travel crate so they can administer the recovery serum. Someone hold the head, sir. Let's go. One, two, three. One, two, three. OK, one, two, three. OK. So hard. He atmet 16 per minute. Atmet good. The recovery serum will now bring Mirza out of his sedation. Mirza's brother Rafiq appears to be stable, but that incident shows why Frank and his team have to be prepared for any emergency. The heartbeat was very, very low and he was not breathing, so that's the reason why we supplied oxygen and some emergency drugs. Resuscitating Mirza cost the team valuable time and they need to push on if they want to have any hope of reaching the airport in time. The tigers in the crates are carefully monitored until it's safe to wake them. Think about the deal. They're checking the heartbeat and seeing if they can wake him up, and then he gets the antidote against the anesthetics. And then we close the door a bit, and uh, as soon as all the wires are out, we close it, and then we wait for him to wake up. Once each animal is awake, its crate can be loaded onto the transporter. Rafiq is being loaded in front of Mirza, who is now fully awake and angry, causing her brother to stress as well. Well, he's uh, trying to get out, I think. I don't know. With a journey of over 24 hours ahead, Mirza's stress levels are dangerously high. Also of concern, the mother tiger, Juno, isn't responding well. The team need to get her reacting before the transport can get underway. Yeah, it's good. She's lifting her head. You're not allowed to transport immobilized animals, so we just needed to be sure that she's really not immobilized anymore. She's just, she has a hangover. If you tease her, um, she lifts the head and she's like, uh, what are you doing? But if you let it go, she just goes down and sleeps. So it's fine, she's sleepy, but she's awake. All of the animals are finally loaded. Now they can start the two-hour road trip to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. Some of the staff at Felida have been caring for these tigers for many years, so this is a bittersweet moment. Yeah, it's very mixed emotions. Yeah. Happy for them, we're gonna miss them terribly, but um, we know where they're going to, and we're absolutely sure they're gonna be delighted. This is the tiger's future home, Lion's Rock, in the Free State, South Africa. Spread over 1,200 hectares, it's home to a variety of big cat, roaming game, and other African wildlife. It started with one group of rescued lions. A former safari park in Austria got bankrupt. There are 14 lions without having any hope for the future and four posts stepped in. After having no luck in finding an existing sanctuary to house the lions, four paws came across a farm in South Africa and decided to establish their own sanctuary. That was in 2007. Today, Lion's Rock is home to more than 120 big cats. With the animals here, they should be in the wild. They shouldn't be in a sanctuary. What we're doing here is just to clean up the last things where the humans did wrong steps to deal with these animals. Being rescued animals, many of the cats at Lion's Rock need regular medical care. Hello, my boy. Hey, how's it? Head of animal welfare, Hildegard Perker has called in local specialist vet, Dr. Peter Caldwell, to look at nine-year-old Genghis. He appears to be limping on his back legs. Calcaneus Achilles tendon, eh? Laxicity of Achilles tendons. Dr. Caldwell's first guess is that damage to the heel bones has caused injury to the Achilles tendons. I suspect his, both calcaneuses were broken at some stage. Broken? And, yeah, and then, they, then the Achilles tendon pulled its skew. You see the knee? Then the, the joint below the knee there. It goes right down. The angulation is down. I think it's causing inflammation and pain. Genghis has been lured into the night room attached to the enclosure. That way it's much easier to dart him. Wow. 
Once he's sedated, he's taken over to the Lions Rock Clinic, where Dr. Caldwell and his team will perform x-rays. Eye drops are given to prevent his eyes drying out. I just want to take some x-ray of his hips and his hind legs because the problem seems to be in the hind legs. Ah, oh, there's crepitus there. At nine years old, Genghis is middle-aged for a lion. In the wild, males seldom live longer than 10 to 14 years. However, in captivity, they can live more than 20 years. All right, what was that left? Uh, left. Okay. Prep for the next one. The lion needs to be turned. To get the next x-ray, the team must put Genghis into a seated position with his hind legs stretched out in front. Not a very flattering look for the king of beasts. All right. Wonderful, Angie. Now you guys must hold it, eh? Hold it straight. I was, I, you do the machine then if you can't hold it straight. Trying to handle over 200 kilograms of deadweight lion is often a struggle. Hold the line on top there, guys. Hold the line. You're letting it collapse. Come, guys. Come here. That's seven people trying to maneuver Genghis into position, and they're not having a lot of success. Oh. Oh. Come, 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 come. Pull the line back. Yeah, it's struggling. Yeah. Oh. The x-rays don't reveal any major problems with the bones in his legs. This is the calcaneus I was talking about. That's, that's totally normal. Achilles tendon is totally normal. So the bones are fine, eh? So it's the spine. Yeah, it's the spine. Eh? I think these ligaments are nothing to worry about. I think it's the spine. OK, take a drip off and let's go. Nothing we can't fix, though. The solution is to put him on a drug program for up to a year. Hildegard can administer his medicine by way of dart gun herself without having to call the vet out. But first, she's going to need a bit of practice. Next, Hildegard discovers firing a hypodermic dart isn't as easy as it looks. Put your dart in and put your doppies in. <laughs> you have to show me. <laughs> okay. And there's a serious situation for one of the tigers left behind at the Felida Big Cat Center. Oh, no, it moves a little bit. Maybe. Oh. OK. <laughs> The six tigers may be on the road to South Africa, but the vet's work hasn't finished at the Felida Big Cat Center in the Netherlands. They're giving medical checkups to some of the older residents at the center, like Sandra, who's been suffering from health problems. Well, Sandra has a bump on her back, um, and we were not sure how uh, it happened, but we think that she probably slipped and got a hernia. Um, and she also had a lot of trouble with her bladder. Sandra's keepers have been treating her with antibiotics, but as soon as the medication stops, her symptoms return, and they're getting worse. At 15 years old, Sandra is nearing the end of her lifespan. Animals that are sick or old often cannot be rehoused due to the dangers involved in anesthesia and transport. Sadly, that means Sandra is unlikely to ever leave the center. However, the team here are still intent on giving her a good quality of life for the remainder of her years. We took a blood sample and now we have her on the infusion line and uh, now we're going to start with the ultrasound examination yeah, and see what we find. The ultrasound quickly reveals a serious problem with Sandra's bladder. It looks like, but you cannot check it, so it looks no. like it's more... Massive. It's more like a mass, yeah? Yeah. The bladder looks pretty filled with uh, something, so before... Of course, we cannot see the quality of the content, but we can just say that it's filled not only with urine, but filled with um, either pus or mucoid, but since um, pus could see some bacterial infection, mm -hmm. the chances of it's pus is mm -hmm. quite high. Oh, now it moves a little bit. You see that? Maybe we... Oh! OK. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> We're going to wait what uh, Frank says about the ultrasound, and then we probably 
put a catheter in and flush it. Analysis of Sandra's blood provides further evidence of serious issues with her vital organs. She has a acetomia, which means that um, special metabolites that have to be excreted over the bladder, the kidneys and the bladder, that they didn't um, get filtered out of the blood, so they are now higher. Further examination reveals damage to the kidneys as well. It's not looking good. You really see a very unregular surface. And also compared to the aorta, the kidneys are already shrunk. The kidneys are so destroyed that it's uh, not reversible anymore. Mm -hmm. With the ultrasound, you see very first signs very early mm -hmm. before you see changes in the blood. But in her, the changes in the blood already indicating mm -hmm. so it's 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 it means she is in pain or whatever yeah, it's just, it's just mm -hmm. big pain we diagnosed um, a very very severe kidney problem so it started already that the, the entire body get intoxicated and um, it is very obvious that this is not reversible mm -hmm. and it's a lot of pain it's very painful mm -hmm. and this we made a clear decision, the best for the animal is to euthanize. So we made a decision for her. It's devastating for the team. They've just given new life to six tigers, and now they had to lose one. Okay, so look through this. Keep both your eyes open. Go point through the window there. Back at Lion's Rock, Hildegard is learning how to use a dart rifle so she can administer monthly medication to Genghis. Put your dart in and put your doppies in. <laughs> you have to show me. <laughs> okay. Come stand aside. The gun needs to be loaded with a cartridge which provides the propulsion for the dart. There are three different strengths of cartridge depending on how far you want to shoot. Brown is the weakest, green is the middle one, and yellow is the strongest. Choose one that you would think you want, would want to use. In which case, for now? Or yeah, so your line's escaped, yeah, and it's running there, just behind the trees, behind that uh, fortuna. From, from where? From, yeah, the stairs, you can't get from closer. Here? Yeah, from here, you've got to shoot that line. <laughs> you uh, said this is the strongest, the yellow yes. one, so I would use this. Okay, put it in. Shooting guns isn't what Hildegard signed up for when she decided to go into animal conservation. I'm a pacifist. I'm, I'm a pacifist. <laughs> now let's go and dart the lion. That's where I aimed. Perfect. Wow, that was a good shot. Was that a yellow one? That was yellow, yes. OK, let's put a green one in. Right, and in. Now shoot a green charge and let's see what this gun does on green charge. Every gun is different. Hildegard shot with the highest strength cartridge first. Green is the middle strength. I feel that that first dart hit way too hard. You probably broke a bone or something. No, it was hard. Yeah, but it was very accurate. So one has to decide. Can I give a brown charge? OK, close. It doesn't even go there. There's nowhere. Go and have a look at those darts and see how deep they went. Wow. <laughs> it hits hard, eh? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that went all the way in there. That would have broken a lion's bump. And that is, and that is a, a that wood. One, that's not a, a lion's bump. That one hit a little less hard. Yellow, I'm scared of. Eh? I never use yellow. You see, that one comes out quickly, eh? Next, the tigers arrive in South Africa, but not everyone's happy. Guys, Rafik is really stressed. Can we just not disturb him more? And a lion that has the specialist amazed. Yeah, I've never actually seen a lion that looks like this before. Wildlife veterinarian Dr. Peter Caldwell is visiting Lion's Rock in South Africa's Free State. Hello, Gypsy, and she's drinking water, which we don't really want her to do. Yeah, it's, but it's okay. It's okay. It's too late. We'll deal with it. 
Hildegard has called him in to inspect several lions with special health problems, like Gypsy, a 14-year-old lion with dwarfism. Yeah, I've never actually seen a lion that looks like this before when I saw her I was astounded. She was born in Romania in 2001 together with a male. I'm not sure exactly how she became so handicapped, but must have happened while she was growing up that they didn't nourish her properly and not enough sun, maybe inbreeding, a lot of factors can have, can have been, but her brother was looking the same. Gypsy and her brother spent over 10 years in a small concrete enclosure in Romania. Eventually, they were rescued by Pantera, the name the Felida Big Cat Center went by before Four Paws took it over. Unfortunately, her brother died in that period before Four Paws took over. And yeah, she's now here since July 2014. And in general, the, the climate here is much better for her joints because she has obviously arthritis. During her past year and a half at Lion's Rock, Gypsy has been in good health. However, in the past month, Hildegard has noticed that she often appears to be in pain. When the animal keepers were coming to feed her every evening in here, she would run, yeah. really like run, hop, 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 funny way, but she runs. And this, uh, a month ago, you could see she was like walking slow. And that is the time when I thought something got worse. Gypsy is obviously one of those cases that is not repairable, but there is a possibility of making her life a lot more comfortable. We're unsure of exactly what caused it. Is it the genetic component causing dwarfism, or is it medication that was used that caused premature closure of growth plates? But it's a syndrome of, of, of things. We call it a syndrome which is a multifactorial. Dr. Caldwell needs to sedate Gypsy before he can inspect her more closely. Sorry, Gypsy. The tigers have landed safely in South Africa and are quickly moved to the loading area for the final leg of the journey to Lion's Rock. Barbara and keeper Yuno traveled with the animals in the cargo plane. During the flight, we checked them once and they responded very well. They seemed calm and relaxed. I think now they're a bit stressed because of all the new people and the new smells and new sounds. So as soon as they're completely loaded, we can take off to Lion's Rock. A big team from Lion's Rock are here to load up the tigers. Rafik, one of the young males, is not happy. Guys, Rafik is really stressed. Can we just not disturb him more? Can we please all stay away from him? He's not very happy and you're stressing him out further. Barbara briefs veterinarian Katja Kupel on the status of the tigers. Well, we were a bit concerned, of course, because uh, Mirza reacted not so well to the sedation and of course you know then be, right before we wanted to transport her she seemed to be not very stable okay so we were very concerned and i see them now being a bit aggressive maybe or agitated but i think it's just i think it's just the situation from being unloaded the loud yes. noise lots of people the team are anxious to get going but that can't happen until the paperwork and formalities are completed what happens when they're landed, when any live shipment is coming, then we've got obviously the cargo agent, which is ensure that all the paperwork is here. Then we've got the state veterinarian who will check all the paperwork, will ensure that these animals have the correct permits, all the veterinary permits are in order. It's been over 24 hours since the tigers were sedated and Rafik is getting increasingly agitated. I think uh, ate all his flooring, his wooden flooring. He has shredded it in the middle and he's just taking all his anger out on the wooden floor. It's supposed to take us, what, four hours about? We're going to have to stop to check on the animals. We have to get fuel for the vehicle. The animals are really stressed. We really want to get them on the road. Finally, the convoy sets off. The four-hour road trip will take them just under 300 kilometers south through the African countryside to the Free State. Along the way, the team stop to refuel and check on the tigers. Rafik appears to have calmed down, but now Mirza has Katja concerned. I've got a report from the vet that he didn't do well on the anaesthetic, so he's very, very flat. In the moment, I'm very worried. 
He's the only one not wanting to interact and what, look out, see the environment. He just wants to be left alone and sleep. And that's not a good sign. That just means something is not right. Back at Lion's Rock, Gypsy, the lion with dwarfism, is going on a much shorter journey. She's off to the clinic for a medical and dental checkup. We're working quite conservatively with Gypsy with respect to sedatives. We use the conservative dose. She went down really well, breathing really well. They noticed two of the canines that were fractured, the, the bottom canines, and they're doing root canals and repairing them. Fractured teeth aren't uncommon in lions. It happens as they get older and their teeth wear down. Many of the rescued lions had a poor diet when they were young, so their teeth are brittle. Two root canals will take a while, so Dr. Caldwell hooks Gypsy up to a respirator to make sure she gets enough oxygen. <laughs> the dentist drills holes at the base and tip of the canine teeth to clean out the inside of the tooth. The pulp is exposed and therefore infection is going to go in, potentially can go all the way into the jawbone. And that can cause abscessation and pain. However, Gypsy's age is not making it easy for the dentists to perform the root canal. As a tooth ages, pulp gets narrower, and that brings its own complications because it's very difficult to find it. And in her case, we had not a very wide pulp, it just takes a lot of work. While the dentists work, blood samples are taken. These will reveal whether her dwarfism is affecting her organs. They finished removing the pulp and are now filling Gypsy's teeth with dental acrylic. It's taken almost three hours to get to this point. We're done, Peter. I'm just waiting for this to set. It's going to be a minute or so. All right, let's go. Dr. Caldwell wants Gypsy to have an X-ray. It'll be the first time she has been X-rayed. Hopefully, this will show whether Gypsy's dwarfism is impacting on other organs in her body. It could reveal if there are any other medical problems that are contributing to her pain. The tigers have finally arrived at Lion's Rock. This could be a traumatic introduction to Africa. All they've ever known are cages and enclosures in a European climate and landscape. Plus, several of the tigers have had a stressful journey. Tomorrow, they will be released and only then will the team get a clear idea of whether the rescue mission has been a success. At Lion's Rock, Gypsy the Lion has had a lengthy operation on her teeth, and the medical team are taking advantage of her still being sedated to give her x-rays to see how her dwarfism is affecting her. We took a whole series of x-rays of her whole skeleton just to get an idea of what we're dealing with. Yeah, those joints are all abnormal. It's very abnormal. The lower joints of the four legs were not great. There was a massive amount of osteoarthritis and uh, degenerative joint disease causing not being able to walk properly, it would occasionally cause pain. Also, it would deter her from obviously being very active Together with her being inactive, you'd get a whole lot of other things, reduced intestinal function, and her metabolism would slow down quite a bit as well. While the prognosis isn't great, it's no surprise to Dr. Caldwell. And it's certainly helped in working out the best course of action. We are able to palliatively treat the condition and symptomatically keep the inflammation at bay and give her a good quality of life, which I think we have achieved, and I think it's a positive outcome in that Irrespective of what she looks like and how she walks, we're still able to give her a good quality of life. The tigers will be released first thing tomorrow, but before that can happen, Johanna, Barbara and Yuno from the Four Paws team want to check out the enclosures. There are trees and uh, there's a pool down there and it's uh, another house there. The tigers will first be released into smaller adaptation enclosures, while the permanent enclosures are being completed. This will help them to acclimatize, because moving animals from very small spaces directly to large areas can cause them stress. Look at this. Wow. 
It's so deep. It's so big. And it's not even filled. I mean... The enclosures have been specifically designed to give the tigers a stimulating environment. Half a hectare of space with plenty of enrichment features. The idea of this, you know, is, is just they need sometimes, uh, of course, shelter from rain, from hot weather, and also from their, for their privacy. To help the tigers transition to their new home, keeper Yuno Fanson will be a familiar face that remains with them until they move into their permanent enclosures. It is better than I expected, actually, if I, I looked at uh, closures on the pictures, but now seeing it for myself, yeah, it's really amazing. I think they will do great here. The following morning, and the moment has finally arrived when the Tigers can be released. But the Four Paws team aren't taking any risks. I'm going to make up a dart in case we have a problem that one of the animals goes through a fence or something. And because we won't have the time to make it when it happens, I'm gonna have it ready and loaded in case there's an emergency. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the very exciting uh, day of the race of the four tigers that are still waiting patiently in the boxes. Safety is number one. And we have here on site two people with rifles. They are ready to protect us if it's necessary, but please don't, don't make it possible. Rafik and Mirza are already in the enclosures, having been released the previous evening. So basically yesterday we released the two males you can see on the left hand side because of medical um, conditions. Rafik was very, very, very stressed. Um, so we decided he needed to go out and he needed to have some time to adjust to the enclosure. Because of the light fading, only those could be released yesterday because it wouldn't have been safe to release them in darkness because they can't see the fences and there's a possibility to run into them and they need to acclimatise. They both have done really, really well. You can see they're lying down. They're still a little bit on the stressed side, but that's normal. They're not used to people. They're not used to cars. Looking at Rafik's crate, it quickly becomes apparent why he had to be released early. You can see he just ate uh, the, the floor completely almost. He hadn't ever experienced something like this. And uh, was also the, one of the big problems was there were so many people out there. And I think the combination of all those factors just made it uh, so stressful for him that he just, yeah, went crazy, yeah. It's a graphic reminder of how powerful tigers are and also of the unpredictability of wild animals. The crates are placed hard up against the enclosure door to avoid the risk of one of the tigers escaping. Okay. First to be released is Juno, the mother. Oh. You know. Not surprisingly, it takes quite a while before she's comfortable about venturing outside the crate. He's a little bit more eager to leave his crate. Yeah, we're in a relaxed hotel. <laughs> it's the first time in 10 years that he's walking on grass. It must be so confusing for him. Hey, hi. Hey, welcome home. The cubs were born at Felida and have never seen grass or experienced enclosures like this. For them, it's a strange new world and very unsettling. Hey. Hey. Come say hello. Hey. Hey, Lars. They're preparing Sita. Hey, Sita. Everything seems fine. Now it's just a matter of waiting to see how well the tigers settle into their new surroundings.
Two days later, Dr. Peter Caldwell receives the blood test results for Gypsy. Now I was extremely happy to see that there were no abnormalities, her kidney function is perfect, her liver function is perfect. And in general, on the inside, she's a healthy cat, a healthy lion. So the only issues that we're going to have to deal with is to keep her pain free. She's just got an amazing personality and a will to want to live. And just that alone is enough for me to want to keep her going. And I think she deserves the opportunity to have a good quality life. For everything she's gone through, I think she deserves it. A good quality of life is also what the Tiger family is now enjoying. It's been several months since they arrived at Lions Rock. They're finally in their permanent enclosures. And they're thriving. It was uh, after, I think, five, six weeks when we had everything done also and when they were adapted well and settled in well that we could release them to the big enclosure. It was actually very funny because they first went out, uh, you know, like testing the ground and checking it out and at the moment we're still hesitating, but after I think 10 minutes, they started running and running up and down and chasing each other. And uh, you could really see that they were surprised that they could run so far, you know? It was really the first time that they could really run. The space to roam, engaging environment, and an active lifestyle is providing clear benefits. The tigers are healthy, inquisitive, and playful. This kind of thing is really nice if you can see it firsthand and you can see how they are enjoying it and how they check out everything. And of course, then you know that all this was done, you know, you know, it was worth everything. And uh, you know that they will have a really good life from there on. So often, wild animals are the casualties of our human existence. Killed for profit. Their habitats under threat, made to live in cramped spaces, poorly fed. They're destined to live out their lives in misery unless someone takes action. Wild Animal Rescue follows the people from the international animal welfare charity Four Paws as they go on daring and sometimes dangerous rescue missions to give animals a better life. In this episode, Four Paws goes on a dangerous mission into the Gaza Strip to rescue two lion cubs. We will be in Rafah. On the Egypt side, it's really a big war. Jihadists killed today, I hear, about 60 soldiers. Tricky negotiations with the cubs' owners. <laughs> and politics and suspicions create chaos for the team. Part of the team allowed to go in, they have the permit to go in, the other cannot go in. Start to be insecure in the border and I cannot divide the team. Rafa on the southern border of the Gaza Strip. In March 2015, images of two lion cubs living with a family in a Palestinian refugee camp go viral. The family bought the cubs from a local zoo that was badly damaged and desperate for money after airstrikes the previous year. Four Paws sends veterinarian Dr. Amir Khalil and his team to investigate. There they find the two-month-old cubs in a cramped three-bedroomed apartment with a family of six children. At first glance, the situation appears harmless, but the living conditions will quickly become dangerous to both people and the lions. Four Paws are eager to find a way of rescuing them from their inappropriate private keeping. Three months later, and the cubs have grown significantly. Now local celebrities, they're frequently paraded around the camp and surrounding areas. But as they're getting larger, it's clear their playful biting and games may soon become a problem. Concerned about the potential danger they pose to children in the camp, children's charity UNICEF has requested help from Four Paws. 
It's not just the risk factor that makes the current arrangement untenable. At five months old, the cubs eat around 40 euros worth of meat per day and are pushing owner Saad al-Jamal to his financial limits. Being located inside the Gaza Strip means there's no easy solution. After months of planning and negotiations, Four Paws has deployed a team to neighboring Jordan and are about to embark on a rescue mission. Dr. Khalil briefs the team on the eve of their departure. He bought two lions with the idea to make a lot of money with these lions. He said, OK, these two lions, I will take them. For example, if there is a football match, they will take the same T-shirt like the players. They are also not in good condition because the nutrition. He don't have the proper food for the animal. The vaccination, there is a lot of also stray animals there like cats and dogs. So it could be a source of infection for the lions or for the kids. It came out very clearly that they will need our help and they will be soon a danger for their surrounding and the lots of children living in this refugee camp. And we were working the last months, like three months or four months, just to be able to do that mission. The plan. The team will take the lions out of Gaza, across the border into Israel, travel 130 kilometers to the Israeli-Jordan border, then another 70 kilometers to a wildlife sanctuary in Jordan. It's an ambitious, daring plan, considering the constant tension between Israel and Palestine's government forces. They consider us, we come from the enemy line, and the Israel consider us, we come back with the enemy line. For it to work, somehow the Four Paws team has to get the approval of authorities in Israel, Palestine and Jordan. Started to coordinate with some embassies, like Israel Embassy in Vienna, uh, Austrian Embassy in Tel Aviv, with a Jordanian colleague. We get approval from all of them that we, we are able to do this mission. Additionally, there are documents required for transporting wild animals across international borders. Even the owner don't have any documentation about his lions. I mean, to support any lions, you need CITES permits, which in the Gaza, there is no CITES uh, authorities. Coordinating between Israel and Palestine hasn't been the only challenge. Owner Saad al-Jamal has reportedly been offered $9,000 for the cubs from an unknown buyer. It's against Four Paws policy to buy animals, and to do so would raise suspicions in Israel about the team's true intentions they will have to rely on the goodwill of the owner. They consider if any money go inside and we support whatever, they consider it you support terrorist organization. What we agreed with the man in the last deal and the last meeting, we can cover what he really borrow. The man borrow money to feed the lion. So if somebody pay his credit, he will be willing to give the lions. At this stage, the owner will honor the agreement to donate the lions to Four Paws. However, there's no guarantee he won't change his mind. Even more of a worry for Dr. Khalil is ensuring the safety of his team throughout the mission. You know, we will be in Rafah. Rafah is like two cities. One is from Israel side, one from Egypt side. On the Egypt side, it's really a big war. And this 48 kilometer is like the hell. Jihadists killed today, I heard about 60 soldiers on this side. Today, don't go on, a, on your own to, to make anything alone. Don't do this. Despite all the risks they face, Dr. Khalil knows he and his team have one thing in their favor. Animal can build bridges between countries. Last time, with the three lions which we took from Gaza, Three countries were able to agree on one thing together. So I can imagine these two lions, maybe it could be a message how to build a bridges and to break these borders. Animals can connect people. The planning is in place. Now it's time to act. The rescue contingent is made up of the Four Paws Rapid Response Team and media from several nations. So good luck for all of us. <laughs> Long day. <laughs> Today, Dr. Khalil hopes the team will be able to travel 60 kilometers across Jordan to the Israeli border and then pass through Israel, entering the Gaza Strip on its northern border at the Erez crossing. They're close to the Israeli border, but before they can cross, 
they must change vehicles and hand over their passports. If any of their paperwork isn't right, the mission could fail right here. If all goes according to plan, this is where the Cubs will end up, Al Mawa, or the New Hope Center in Amman, Jordan. This is actually for the two new Cubs. Uh, we only need to electrify the fence, and then it's ready to go um, and waiting for the Cubs. Established in 2010, this wildlife facility is backed by Jordanian royalty. A collaboration between the Princess Alia Foundation and Four Paws, it's an ex-livestock farm that's been converted into a halfway house for rescued animals. Its main role is as a rescue center where medical treatment can be administered and the first stages of rehabilitation can begin. The New Hope Center is home to big cats, bears, wolves, primates and many other animals. And there are plans afoot for big improvements. Al Ma'wa, the sanctuary, it has two functional units. Um, the New Hope Center, which basically is the clinic and the, the first two phases of the rehabilitation. And then the second functional unit is Jarash, which is the main sanctuary, the permanent natural enclosures. Obviously, the situation isn't ideal. I mean, even here, the cages are much too small. But from there, the idea came to have a proper sanctuary, which we're working on. And hopefully, that will be ready in a couple of months, and the animals will be in much bigger spaces. The new sanctuary in Jarash, Al Mawasuf, will be a state-of-the-art facility covering over 140 hectares. It's in a very beautiful area and in fact it's an area that's quite endangered because it's one of the last Mediterranean natural forests in the region and Jordan obviously doesn't have that many trees so we try and protect them. We see the animals as they're supposed to be, relaxed uh, and people like to see them so hopefully it'll be a, a, a good awareness for people in the region as to how these animals really ought to be kept. The Four Paws team have made it out of Jordan and are crossing into Israel. Their route to the Gaza Strip takes them through the heart of Jerusalem. Wir sind hier gerade an Eris äh, Crossing oder Grenzübergang gekommen und hier fängt den, sagen wir, den richtigen Abenteuer und Herausforderung jetzt. Jetzt geht's richtig los. Next, there's trouble at the Gaza border. I cannot divide the team. At the moment we have to go in one and to leave one. Animal rescue charity Four Paws is sending a team to the Gaza Strip to rescue two lion cubs from a refugee camp. The team has traveled through Jordan and Israel and is approaching the Israeli-Gaza border. The Erez crossing is made up of three checkpoints. First, the Israeli border control, then the Palestine Liberation Organization, and finally, the Palestine-controlled immigration point. The crossing has been the scene of much violence. A suicide bomber killed four people here in 2004. Israeli border and military personnel now sit in offices high above ground level, watching through windows and closed circuit television. The team has a long transit through a caged passage that crosses the buffer zone to reach the Palestinian border. It's a setting that puts all of the Four Paws team on edge. It was a long, long issue to get the permit to enter to Gaza. So it was really a very long day. I will see in war of nerves. <laughs> it could be a lot of political influence on this issue. So I hope to keep quiet till we have the alliance and our ownership. We have clear contract, clear communication. And I hope, yeah, we'll be able to manage. Amir. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Gaza. Dr. Khalil is doing his best to play down the significance of their mission. They still have one checkpoint to go, and he doesn't want to attract the attention of an overzealous security official. The final transit through no man's land is taken by taxi. 
but the team's progress comes to a sudden halt at Gaza immigration. The border is closed now on Israel side, so the colleagues cannot go back. Part of the team allowed to go in, they have the permit to go in, the other cannot go in. And they said it is a security matter, so it is a tough situation at the moment, yeah. tough situation. Start to be insecure in the border, everyone says it's not secure in the evening, it's an empty area. Military take over here, and I cannot divide the team. At the moment we have to go in one and to leave one. The team has little choice but to wait in no man's land and hope the Gaza authorities will eventually issue permits for them to enter. I am here, Vice Director. I come here to help you. We don't want to delay you, but it's not our order. Our order comes from inside, Gaza inside office. If they there is in and order to allow you to enter, it's okay for us. We like, we like this order. We wait as you. But up, up to now, there is no uh, any order, okay? Dr. Khalil's plan to retrieve the lion cubs tonight is looking very unlikely. And to make matters worse, Saad, the cub's owner, is starting to have doubts. He think like we lie him or the guys lie him because he said to him since two days we are on the way, we are coming, but no one is there, he's waiting. The Four Paws team has spent months convincing Saad to donate the lions, and in the time lost here at the border, there's the very real risk he could change his mind. He's had an offer of 9,000 US dollars for the cubs. Very tempting for a father of six living in a refugee camp. It's going to be a long night. Most of the crew decide to bed down for the evening. We just got our room for tonight, luxury apartment, five beds, and we hope we get a few hours of sleep now. I think Amir, as the mission leader, will not sleep as something could happen. Even though nothing is likely to happen tonight, Dr. Khalil's experience on major rescue missions in Palestine has taught him to be ready for all eventualities. In 2014, Al-Bissan Zoo in northern Gaza sustained horrific damage from airstrikes during the conflict lasting 51 days. By the time the ceasefire was declared, more than 80 animals had perished. Of the 20 animals still alive, some were wounded and all were traumatized and starving. The situation was desperate and Dr. Khalil led the Four Paws rescue team. We saw here two lions, one male and one female. They survived the war here. One line was with them passed away from the missiles which attack these enclosures here. As we see, the animal keepers cannot clean this place at all since over 55 days now. The female is apparently pregnant, which means if they have her kids or babies, she will, they will pass away. No water, no food. Really very, very bad situation for the animals. The team delivered urgently needed medicine and food to the animals. They also restored the water supply and carried out repairs to enclosures. The lions were relocated to the New Hope Center in Jordan, where they're now recovering. It's early morning and there's been no change in the local authorities' position on letting all of the team into Gaza. So with time running out, Dr. Khalil is forced to make a decision. Amir just woke me up that we don't have any other chance just to go now only the four post team, pick up the lions, negotiate with the owner, because it will get too late and we will have no chance to get the lions if we wait any longer. Only three members of the rapid response team have permission to enter Gaza. Despite Dr. Khalil's concerns about his team being at risk if they split up, he has no choice because the Israeli border will close for the weekend shortly after midday. It's a little before seven in the morning. I have less than five hours to go to pick up the line and to come here and they will let us go. 
So I hope this is the truth. <laughs> With their passports held at the border, Dr. Khalil's hoping the team can get in and out as quickly as possible. The operation is now attracting a lot of attention, and the longer it goes on, the greater the risk one of the local authorities will intervene. The unit travels south to Rafa, where the cubs are being kept. Their route takes them through the heart of the Gaza Strip. It's only an hour's journey, but the scars of decades of war are a constant reminder that this area is still extremely volatile. Conflict can break out at any time. Next, the rescue team may not be able to get out of Palestine. We have a problem. The border is closed, which is really mad. You cannot go here, you cannot go here. After months of preparation, the team finally reaches the Al Shabura refugee camp and sets eyes on the lion cubs. The female cub, Mona, has a large swelling on the back of her head. Max, the male, looks reasonably healthy. Despite Saad al-Jamal being relatively poor, the cubs have been well cared for. But the cost of fresh meat is one of the reasons he's decided they can't continue to keep them. For the border crossing to go smoothly, Saad must sign transfer of ownership papers and other documentation. Letting the cubs go is especially hard for 18-year-old Ibrahim. Along with his father, he's been the main caregiver. Like so many young people in Gaza, he has no work prospects, okay. so the Cubs have been a distraction from the futility of daily life, giving him something worthwhile to do. They've probably also given him some status in the local community. Saad and Ibrahim accompany the team back to the border to make their final farewells. The cubs are used to being handled by humans, but they're getting to a size where they could easily inflict a nasty bite. وأثبت للعالم إنه الأسد ممكن يعيش داخل البيت ويصل لسن أي عمر قرب على السنة ولا وألفين جدا داخل البيت أكيد صعب كتير لحظة مؤلمة جدا. The story has broken in the local press. Journalists and curious bystanders have come to see Max and Mona. For a time, security becomes incredibly relaxed and there's almost a carnival atmosphere as soldiers and locals come to get a glimpse of the cubs. As a parting gift, Dr. Khalil presents Ibrahim with a book about Lion's Rock, a wildlife sanctuary similar to where Max and Mona will eventually be rehoused. Finally, it's time for the cubs to go. <laughs> Dr. Khalil is visibly affected. He's come to know the family well and has seen how much the cubs mean to Saad and Ibrahim. 
The extended goodbye and the attention from media has cost precious time. Now the team are under pressure to get back to the Israeli border before midday. Being a Friday, the border closes early. The heat and commotion are also causing major stress for the Cubs. The sooner they can be moved into a quiet, cool setting, the better. But just as the team are about to leave the final Palestinian checkpoint, they hit another roadblock. We are facing again second problem about the coordination with the Israeli to bring the lines in. They don't know exactly what's needed. So the suggestion now is that I have to go inside to coordinate with the vets there to explain and to understand and to go ahead. Dr. Khalil has veterinary passports and a certificate showing the lions were a donation. However, the Israeli authorities are asking for further documentation. Dr. Khalil's calling officials who helped with the previous rescue mission in Gaza. You assist us and you join me and my team during the last lion transfer to, from Gaza to Amman. In order to enter Israel, the lions need health and veterinary certificates from the Palestinian Ministry of Agriculture or a waiver from the Israeli authorities. I don't want to make pressure on you, sir. I really... Yes, I am with the lion. I am with the lion with the cages. They are young sizes. I think them was my hand. I really, I need your help now. Dr. Khalil is trying to state a case for getting the cubs to a place where they can receive medical attention, particularly the swelling on Mona's head, which needs proper medical assessment. I hope that the Israel side and the Agriculture Ministry Department here, which are in contact with us, to assist us to issue uh, a quick permit for urgent need and urgent medical care need for these two lions. While Dr. Khalil continues to appeal to the authorities, the hours quickly pass by, and Israeli officers are closing down for the weekend. Thank you, sir. We have a problem. Yes, sir. I said they close one thirty. I said, but the team are here since 15 before 12. We, we give the passport 15 before 12. The official communication came, the border is closed. You have to wait here till they open the border, which will be on Sunday, which is really mad. We see still people coming out, you don't understand, this is the rules. But at the end of the day, the military decide here and they say the border is closed. And it's a Shabbat, so that's it where we are now. Yeah, that's it. Shabbat is the seventh day of the Jewish week and their day of rest. Starting on Friday evening and finishing Saturday night, the Israeli border would be closed until Sunday. For the Four Paws team, it means 36 hours waiting in limbo at the Gaza border, and that could be disastrous for the Cubs. But just when it looks like the rescue mission is doomed to failure, Dr. Khalil receives another phone call. This was the Minister for Foreign Affairs here in, in Gaza. Yeah. And he just called to confirm they will let us pass. We have just to leave our passport at the border. And Sunday morning when we leave, we take the passport back. The entire team will now go back to Gaza. Although it's the opposite direction to where they want to go, it's a better option than two nights in no man's land. team are being sent to a hotel in Gaza City, where they must stay under house arrest until they have permission to enter Israel. For Dr. Khalil, any hopes of keeping a low profile on the operation have now been dashed. Checking in two lions raises more than a few eyebrows at the upmarket Gaza hotel. Fortunately, the hotel manager is willing to accept the unusual guests. Their room, a small garden area behind his office. Sie werden hier zumachen mit einem Abzaun jetzt, mit dem Direktor, ja. Und die können jetzt frei lassen in der nächsten Stunde, für nächste zwei Tage, das ist besser. Erst einmal ein bisschen los von diesen Ketten und wollen Wasser trinken. Die haben fast nichts getrunken den ganzen Tag. Es das heißt, sie sind müde für uns. Sie wollen was essen. 
It's been a long day for all involved, not least Dr. Khalil, who's now been awake for over 36 hours. With the lions safe, the team can eat and rest and figure out the next move in the morning. Coming up, can they get Mona to safety in time? He's very sick, he's very vain. The following day, and Mona and Max are being waited on hand and foot by hotel manager Basil Shawa. It's very nice guest. Beautiful animals. We don't have places for the animals, but we can manage to put him, them in this small garden here, and we keep him safe. Basil's also playing it safe by keeping them well fed. I saw the doctor yesterday, they feed them, and I no idea if they are stomach full, they don't eat people. <laughs> Some house guests are impossible to please, though. The cubs were brought up on chicken, and it appears good quality beef is not to their taste. It looks as if they'd rather stick to what they know. Inside the hotel, Dr. Khalil is meeting with the local coordinator for the rescue mission. He's heard that some locals aren't happy about it. Mohanad is one of our main contact person. Obviously, our colleagues who are supporting our mission, makes the logistic for us. And it was regarding some troubles with some guys which are not happy that we are here and that we take the lines out. They think, OK, we export animals, we make their territory are empty from the precious wild animals. These guys are angry and they will try to stop and do everything possible to stop us to leave this trip. This is worrying news. Dr. Khalil and the team can only sit tight and hope it doesn't get out of hand. In the meantime, he finally gets an opportunity to inspect the cubs. This cup stick from the mom is about four weeks age, so they don't have really the proper colostrum or from the milk of the mom, which is really difficult in a way. It's not really the proper immune system they have. They don't have the proper nutrition in the last months. So I, you can see also the skin problems here. They need special medical care in the coming weeks. The proper vaccination. <laughs> They never were visited by a vet, but this one, as you see, is really weak. Dr. Khalil is particularly concerned about Mona's head injury. Hey. Yeah, he's very sick, he's very vain. It's water under something hit him. But what is also worried is that don't eat today what I understood. A check of the cub's reflexes suggests Mona's swelling is either a symptom or the cause of other problems. I think you have a serious problem because you don't really react like the other lions, if you see the eye. You see You see this one? You can, you can see his head and he's, he's, no, no. He, he's aggressive. Sure. He's, thicker, he's afraid. And the pupil opening reflex is not very clear. I will bring later in the evening like my lights and try to check him probably. The enforced stopover in Gaza gives Dr. Khalil the opportunity to meet with a Palestinian government representative. He is representing the Minister for Agriculture here in Gaza Strip. The main point was how to solve the problem of wild animals which are living in private zoos and private captivity in Gaza for long term. There are around seven privately run zoos in war-torn Gaza. Many of them are struggling to provide food and medicines for their animals. On a previous trip in April 2015, Dr. Khalil and the Four Paws team witnessed horror conditions at the Khan Yunus Zoo in the central Gaza Strip. It had run out of money to pay its zookeepers and fallen into serious disrepair. Cages were full of waste and debris, and animals that had died of starvation had been stuffed and put back on display. 
this is very bad to show kids or children uh, this way. I know the situation and the financial situation is not good. So we bring food for three months. We treated the lioness, which is here, to succeed to treat some other animal and vaccinate a lot of animals. The meeting is to discuss an offer by Four Paws to help create a public park with species-appropriate conditions if the government can provide a site. They confirm they are able to confiscate all this animal and to put them in a place and to stop this problem with wild animal kept in private captivity. The government official also has good news regarding the veterinary certificates for the cubs. The proper documentation which should be issued today, latest early morning tomorrow, for the Lions Cups to be moved to Jordan. This should be coordinated with the Israel Authority. Just when it seems progress is finally being made, there is more bad news. The Palestinian authorities have become suspicious about the group's intentions in Gaza and have summoned them to an interview. I spoke in between with somebody from Ministry of Interior which is a man in charge in this case. Sure, he, he was not happy about all the situation, what happened. He said we create a lot of problems. We have to meet him personally tomorrow morning. All the group, without exception. The main issue for him, he has to clarify why foreigners and journalists don't coordinate with the Office of Media in Gaza. Why, when they inform the group to leave the border the first day, why they slept at the border? One thing is now certain. The team won't be getting out of Gaza tonight. With time to kill, Dr. Khalil has made a call to Rafa and invited Saad and Ibrahim to come by the hotel. After several stressful days on the move with strangers, Mona and Max are clearly overjoyed to see some familiar faces. Despite the strong bond between them, Dr. Khalil is convinced it's right to be taking the cubs away. I feel very honest, happy that, that I see them together again. It's nice, they like to play, but they play their game. And they're still wild animal. If they get angry, I believe they will be very, very wild. And when they get adult and more stronger, more powerful, this is really risky. They are not pet animals. They are still wild animals. This is the perfect opportunity for Dr. Khalil to find out if Saad and Ibrahim know how Mona came about her head injury. He imagined it could be from the zoo, where it was, because he kept it sometimes at the zoo. And this is about two weeks now like this. Saad and Ibrahim leave, knowing their cubs are in good hands. Next, the rescue team have a chance to get across the border. There is a hope. There is a hope. We can go. The team were up at 8 a.m. to meet Palestinian officials at the Office of the Interior Ministry. No cameras were allowed inside. It, it was a lot of explanation. Uh, at first, the apology about what happened. Suspect journalists report that there is ISIS in Gaza, which is not the true, and we're aware that some of you come. And exactly at 4 o'clock, uh, that the border will be closed. So it was a lot of misunderstanding. But Dr. Khalil still can't afford to relax. There remains the possibility of intervention from the group opposed to the removal of the lions. Back at the hotel, the team swings into action as permits from the Ministry of Agriculture arrive. The team is ready, and they really are wishing to pass through you with your assistance and our colleague waiting. With all the paperwork now in place, the team is just awaiting the final go-ahead from Israel. There is a hope. 
There is a hope. Five minutes we know, but we will not wait this five minutes. We have to go prepare our things, prepare ourselves for the trip. The team scrambled to pack and be ready to leave. Carry me with me the lions or the cages. Let's go. Max and Mona have been given a low dose of sedative in their drinking water to keep them calm for the last step of their journey. This is where the team was held up two days earlier, but now they have all the necessary paperwork. waiting to go into the Israeli part of the Ares crossing. It looks like that everything is well organized. We're contact, in contact with the Israeli side, with the military and the coordination of the crossing, and everything will be fine, hopefully. The lines are OK. They are still quiet. I mean, they get some small sedative in the water. It's still quiet. This is fine. And we still have the trip till Jordan, but I hope we will manage. Wait, 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 wait. The journey through Israel is in stark contrast to the scenes the team witnessed during their time in Gaza. At the Jordanian border, they finally meet up with the Amman team who've had an anxious wait over the last few days. You know, it's been like, are they coming today? They're not coming today. Guys are ready since the morning. We were waiting. And then, you know, uh, the message is saying, no, we're not coming today. It seems tomorrow. Half an hour then later, you know, you say, no, we're coming today. Finally, the team arrives at the New Hope Center in Amman. Princess Alia has come to greet the team and welcome her newest residents. This is the first time Dr. Khalil has seen the cub's new home. This is nice. It's perfect, it's well done. We're trying to put this one. The other way around. These tentative first steps mark the end of the journey and the start of a new life for Max and Mona. To see some creature come from a not ideal situation and be able to be part of a relief for it is, is, is really a, a huge pleasure. Hopefully they'll now be able to become proper lions as opposed to pets. For the entire team, it's moments like this that make the sleepless nights and dangerous work all worth the effort. These success stories, when you get these animals out and put them in the sanctuaries, prove them a secure life, this is the, the best ever. Very, very happy that the lions will start a new life. They don't need to be more as show or actress on the beach. They don't need more for one or two shekels just to get a picture with somebody. They don't need to sleep with the children. They can play with each other and they can grow and they are wild animals. And I'm happy they will be just the lions. The following morning, with the cubs more settled, Dr. Khalil can finally remove the last trace of Mona and Max's private keeping. And as the curious cubs begin to explore their new environment, they make an exciting discovery. 
they're not alone. They're very, very curious what's going on on the other place. They try to communicate. The line from the other side try to communicate. I see also the like their place. They're really discovering it. And I'm happy that the female, she's in much better condition. She's more active, moving. And then this is a very good sign, very good sign. In a future episode, we'll follow the cubs as they take the final step of their journey into the newly completed Al Mawasuf Animal Sanctuary. So often, wild animals are the casualties of our human existence. Killed for profit, their habitats under threat, made to live in cramped spaces, poorly fed. They're destined to live out their lives in misery unless someone takes action. Wild Animal Rescue follows the people from the international animal welfare charity Four Paws as they go on daring and sometimes dangerous rescue missions to give animals a better life. In this episode, we follow a four-year mission to save 15 brown bears in Kosovo. Locked in small cages and used as attractions at small private zoos and even local restaurants, their future is bleak if Four Paws doesn't take action. And a Four Paws team goes to Romania to rescue Europe's last wild horses from the slaughterhouse. Four Paws have received information about bears being held in appalling conditions in Kosovo. Project leader Karsten Hertwig and Jette Lepaya have been sent to see if the condition of the bears warrants a rescue mission. Also in aller Regel kommen sie aus der freien Wildbahn, werden als ähm, Bärenweise oder zumindest eben als Baby ähm, aus der Wildnis herausgeholt. Die Schicksale sind unterschiedlich. Teilweise eben ist die Mutter erschossen worden oder beim Verkehrsunfall ums Leben gekommen. Teilweise werden sie einfach auch ähm, der Mutter weggenommen. Kosovo is still reeling from the effects of the Kosovo War at the end of last century. The war brought widespread destruction, claiming more than 10,000 lives. But the toll of war and its aftermath isn't just measured in human lives. Animals are usually the first to suffer. Brown bear populations in Europe have been decimated by war, hunting and habitat loss. It's estimated there are 3,000 bears left in the Balkans. However, the illegal trade of animal parts means their future is uncertain. The bear Karsten is going to see has been used to attract people to dine at this restaurant. It's a common practice in this region. Yeah, Cassandra, bären Weibchen, we're tipping so etwa eight years old. Um, dürfte, seit sie bären Weisen, bären Baby is here sein. Also sie hat eigentlich so den absolut schlechtesten ähm, Zustand. Cassandra is a Eurasian brown bear. The very fact that she's awake suggests she's under a lot of stress. If she were in the wild, she would have gone into hibernation a month ago, and she wouldn't wake up for another four. But the horrific conditions she's being kept in have totally upset her normal patterns of behavior. Ja, das ist natürlich völlig inakzeptabel für eine äh, Braunbärenhaltung. Das sind 2 mal 3 Meter Käfig, ähm, mitten der Witterung ausgesetzt. Das heißt, im Sommer viel Sonne, kaum Regen. Im Winter jetzt eben die Kälte, der Wind. Sadly, Cassandra is not the only brown bear in Kosovo suffering a miserable existence. Around 40 kilometers away lies the small town of Pritzren. Carsten's been tipped off that there are two bears being kept here in very poor conditions. Again, there's a restaurant involved, but this time there's a small zoo attached. The bears are in a large cage, but it's nowhere near big enough for animals of their size. Also die Bären leben hier katastrophal, nur Betonuntergrund, kein Wasser, kaum Schatten und unglaublich gestresst und vor allem deswegen, weil unter ihnen sind ähm, kleine Zwinger mit Wölfen und Hunden und die machen einen unglaublichen Lärm. Also jedes Mal, wenn ich hier war, haben die Hunde einen unglaublichen Lärm gemacht und die Bären waren unglaublich gestresst. Ja. 
These two are called Ari and Arina, and like Cassandra, they've been caught by animal traders when they were young and sold to the restaurant owner. To stem the bear trade in Kosovo and step into line with other countries, a law was passed in 2010, making it illegal to keep bears privately. But with nowhere to place confiscated animals, it hasn't been properly enforced. Papiermäßig ist alles auf EU Standard mehr oder weniger. Implementierung ist ein anderes Problem und das ist was wir jetzt versuchen auch hinzukriegen. Returning the bears to the wild is sadly not an option. Being too used to people, they would be easy prey for animal traders. So the Kosovan Ministry of Environment have come up with a solution involving four paws. Wir haben von der Stadt Pristina jetzt ähm, eine Fläche zur Verfügung gestellt bekommen von 15 Hektar. Wir werden im Zuge der nächsten Jahre große Sektoren bauen, mindestens 3000, ähm, besser 5000 Quadratmeter pro Jahr. Good news and also bad, because Cassandra, Ari and Arena will have to stay where they are until at least some of the sanctuary is built. The big worry is how long Cassandra can survive in her present state. <lacht> For each of the last three years, Four Paws veterinarian Ovidiu Rosu has spent six months looking after wild horses in northeastern Romania. Someone fitted a rope halter to this horse when it was a foal in an effort to tame it. Now it needs to be removed, because as a horse grows larger, the halter can bite into the flesh and cause serious injury. It's one of approximately 500 wild horses living in the Danube Delta, the last wild horses to be found in Europe. These animals can be traced back to the 13th century, when the Tatars of Mongolia invaded this region, bringing their horses with them. Over the centuries, they were farmed for meat and used as working horses. Some also became wild, establishing a population here in the Letia forest, which lies in the northeastern part of Romania's Danube Delta. The Danube is Europe's second longest river, and over the last 6,000 years, sediment has been building up at its mouth to form the Danube Delta, Europe's second largest wetland area. Declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site and Romania's oldest natural reserve, it's rich in bird and marine life and hosts some rare species of plants. When horse farming ceased in 1989, many of the horses were freed and the wild population grew to 1,500 by 2010. Environmentalists were concerned the growing number of horses would impact on the delicate natural balance of the ecosystem, so Romanian authorities decided to take action. The horses were the scapegoats for ruining this uh, highly protected forest. And the authorities uh, thought that the easiest solution would be to, to cull, to shoot these horses. Four Paws vigorously opposed the idea of culling and proposed an alternative, a birth control vaccine which, over time, would reverse the population growth without harming any animals. This vaccine goes to the eggs um, makes it some sort of a shield, like a cover, so that the, the, the sperm will not enter through it. It doesn't affect the behavior of the animals, it doesn't affect uh, any, any social uh, status of the animal inside the group. The first dose of the vaccine needs to be given orally, which means Ovidio has to tranquilize the animal, no easy task with these fast and flighty creatures free to roam the almost 3,000 hectares of reserve. The vaccine works on the egg, so is only given to the mares. First of all, you have to identify which is female. Each herd of wild horses typically has a lead stallion and a lead mare, whose roles are to protect the group. 
The lead mare travels at the front, and the stallion pushes from behind. Oh, oh. perfect shot. It's a quite powerful dosage. Otherwise, we cannot have them fast tranquilized. A quick tranquilization is important because of the risk posed by the lead stallion. As the mare begins to react to the anesthesia, he can become concerned about her behavior and try to keep her moving. If they take too long to sleep, they might be, the mares might be kicked by the males. Sometimes it's near impossible to get the horses to lie down. They have this passive stability system that actually allows them to somehow sleep while standing. So that's why it takes a little bit of time. This mare has remained standing for too long. Ovidio has no choice but to administer a second dose of anesthesia. How many minutes has it been? Quite Seven? a lot. Okay. No, no, more. Than more? That. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's a strong one, huh? Coming up, has a video's second dart brought the mare down in time? And the first wave of bear rescues in Kosovo sweeps into play. Four Paws has come to Kosovo to rescue up to 15 bears being held captive in atrocious conditions. Karsten has wrecked the first three, Cassandra, Ari and Irina. But the rescue was delayed until stage one of the new bear sanctuary in Kosovo is finished. It's now ready, so the first rescue can happen. They start with the bear in most urgent need, Cassandra. But Cassandra's owner can't understand why she's being taken and fails to see what's wrong with her current condition. To ensure there's no trouble, the team are backed up by police and the Kosovo force, the NATO-backed peacekeepers. In order to safely transport Cassandra to the sanctuary, the team must first tranquilize her. The metal crook keeps Cassandra's head down. She may be weak and malnourished, but she's still considerably bigger and stronger than her would-be saviors. Safely inside a purpose-built travel crate, it takes six strong men to move her to the waiting vehicle. Cassandra has the honor of being the first resident of the new Pristina Bear Sanctuary. She'll stay in this interior treatment cage while work continues on her outside enclosure. This will enable her to regain her health and adjust to her new surroundings. Now the Four Paws team move on to the zoo in Shkweponya to rescue Ari and Arena. Again, the Four Paws team come with police and military support, but this time the media have been alerted by the bear's owners. It appears they're not happy about losing the prime attraction at their restaurant slash zoo. The bear's owners have called in friends and associates in an effort to intimidate the Four Paws team. Worried the situation could get out of hand, the team decide they need to act now. They tranquilize both of the bears at the same time. Once they're sedated, they have to get them into transport crates before the drug wears off. While the sedation is going smoothly, other elements are conspiring to make this a challenging rescue. The owners have stopped the Four Paws vehicles from entering the property. This is for us a challenge more because they don't 
ähm, logistisch mit dem Inhaber der Bären kooperieren können. Er ist nicht stur, wir müssen lange Wege jetzt mit den Transportboxen nachher gehen, weil wir nicht ähm, auf den Hof fahren können, lauter solche Sachen. It doesn't help that the cages are up so high. They must gently lower several hundred kilos of brown bear down to ground level, into the transport crates, and then the long haul out to the waiting vehicle. It all goes according to plan. The Four Paws team are elated at having completed two successful bear rescues. Es ist ein großer Schritt für den Tierschutz im Kosovo, der heute gerade passiert ist. Und der Weg ist beschritten und wir gehen diesen Weg entlang. Wir werden alle Bären hier im Kosovo, die jetzt privat gehalten werden, rauskriegen aus den Käfigen. Wir werden in eine neue Zukunft gehen können. But their joy is short-lived with the news that two other restaurant bears intended for rescue have been killed. Faced with his bears being confiscated, the owner sold them to an animal dealer for 500 euros. The police found their dead bodies dumped amongst garbage, their organs harvested for the lucrative Asian market. Das macht jetzt die Situation so dringend äh, und wir wollen eben jetzt ähm, komplett ähm, alle Bären, ähm, die noch in Restaurants hier im Kosovo dahin vegetieren, jetzt retten. With two dead, can they rescue the remaining bears in time? On the Danube Delta in Romania, veterinarian Ovidiu Rosu and project leader Robert Hengel are carrying out a population control program on the last herd of wild horses to be found in Europe. A contraceptive vaccine must be given to each mare, but for that to happen, they have to be sedated. Ovidiu has already shot one tranquilizer at this mare. She's unsteady on her feet, but refuses to go down. There's a risk the stallion may start kicking her to get her moving, so Ovidiu fires a second tranquilizer. He just doesn't want to go down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's quite often this happens. Finally, after nearly 30 minutes. While the mare is sedated, the video and Robert need to record her statistics and perform health checks. But they're being closely watched. That's a real man, <laughs> a real stallion. It's common for wild horses to have one partner they spend the most time with. Careful, careful. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Estimates based on aerial surveys put the number of remaining horses at approximately 500. In the past three years, Ovidiu has treated about half of them. Our aim is not to, to actually to kill the population down, it is to manage it responsibly. This population control program by Four Paws was sparked by the so-called Letia Massacre scandal in 2011. The locals were basically rounding up loads of horses uh, to sell them to the slaughterhouse. Following claims that the wild horse population was growing too fast and destroying the environment, Romanian authorities gave landowners in the village of Letia permission to round up some of the wild horses. More than 70 horses were corralled together into several small pens. These beautiful, wild, free living horses were crouched, crowded up with no food and no water. Belonging to different herds, the horses fought each other, leading to severe injuries. After a week in the pens, the horses were sent to be slaughtered. They rounded up the horses uh, into a double-decker uh, slaughterhouse truck, and they, they pushed in too many horses. A couple of them were dead already, in the squashed together and, you know, kicked by the other animals. Fortunately, four paws prevented the truck reaching its destination. Only after 30 hours, our team was able to stop this transport, and um, overnight, we became owners of more than uh, 50 horses. The horses were brought to a farm where they received food, water, and medical care. 
We managed in the end to, to save about 45 horses in total. And after three months of quarantine and uh, three months, we were able to bring them back in, uh, in Leta. Some of those horses are still alive and being monitored by Ovidiu and Robert. Wow, look at that. Next, Robert has to perform a task he's not at all happy about. Oh boy, oh man. And in Kosovo, there's the final big push to rescue all of the remaining restaurant bears. The news that two of the Kosovo bears have been sold and slaughtered for their body parts has put pressure on the Forpors team to rescue the remaining eight bears. They decide to rescue all eight within 24 hours. At the restaurant in western Kosovo, the team find two bears, Arusha and Balusha. The smaller Balusha is in a terrible state. Das sind zwei Mädchen, die können nicht mehr zusammengesperrt. Dem einen fehlt ein Auge, das ist ausgekratzt. Das zweite Auge ist auch blind, vermutlich auch eine Verletzung, eine Infektion. Die Zähne sind von dem einen Bären sehr kaputt und er hat sehr viele Narben, vermutlich von Kämpfen. Bears are mostly solitary creatures in the wild, so it's little wonder they clash when they're forced to share a cramped space. The rescue goes smoothly. As soon as they're sedated, the veterinary team start giving Belusha the medical care she so desperately needs. The next restaurant bear is 20 kilometers away, a 15-month-old female bought from hunters. We have been here for a while. They know that I have a lot of deer here. And they ask me if I have a bear. They have probably caught them somewhere in our wilderness. With their hunting dogs. And they have said, why not? Then he discovered laws were being introduced to make it illegal for bears to be kept in private zoos. I had before, also, it's not on so plain TV to let them. Also, should a bigger park to make here. But as I heard that it's not going to happen, I had to let them be so much away. Being seen as a bad investment has meant she hasn't been properly cared for. He is underdeveloped. He is very dry. We have him now in a bottle. The teeth are very bad. We have to see. But the narcotics are still so far so good. He is stable. We can now sell him. That's two rescues completed safely. The last one promises to be the most difficult of all. Five fully grown bears, all held in one enclosure. Also wir können die nicht separieren. Ja, es gibt keine richtige ähm, Absperrmöglichkeit jeweils. Äh, das ist einfach nicht möglich hier. Und äh, von dem her ähm, bleibt unser Sicherheitsgrund überhaupt nichts anderes übrig, als fünf Bären gleichzeitig na zu narkotisieren. Das ist natürlich auch wirklich für das Ärzteteam eine Herausforderung. If the bears become agitated, it'll be difficult to dart them. So the vets keep noise and activity to a minimum. There are five vets, one for each bear, to ensure the operation runs safely and quickly. Initial medical checks would normally be carried out inside the enclosure, but not today. It's too dangerous, because with so many bears, there's a chance one of them might wake up. Checks outside the cage reveal they're carrying numerous injuries, probably caused by fighting. Yeah, this is a bit of a wound that Jetzt auch noch extern behandeln, um die um, Antibakterien zu reinigen. Weighing more than 200 kilos, the bears are difficult to move into the crates. Eventually, the team load the last captive bear in Kosovo into the van. The most difficult phase of the rescue mission is over. Now it's just a matter of giving them time to settle in at the sanctuary. After years of living in confined conditions, it can be a big shock to be suddenly surrounded by large areas of open space. For that reason, they're first released into smaller enclosures. It's a special moment for the rescue team. Hierher zu bringen, ihnen jetzt dieses Gehege sozusagen zu übergeben und ihnen die Zukunft hier zu ermöglichen. Das ist einfach ein wunderschönes Gefühl.
700 kilometers away in the Danube Delta, Robert is having a not so wonderful moment with a sedated mare. She's been given the contraceptive vaccine, but the medical check requires they obtain a fecal sample. Usually there's some reaction that uh, some uh, feces comes out, but in this case, uh, none came out, so I'll have to uh, put my hand uh, in, in the anus and uh, but obviously I will put some paraffin so it uh, goes, goes in easily and then I can uh, get out some feces. So uh, it's very exciting. Hmm. Okay, here goes. Oh boy. I'm sure you can do it. And I just go in with my whole hand if there's nothing. Yeah, just maybe we can take this. <laughs> okay. Robert isn't a trained vet. He's a desk jockey, an administrator with four paws. So he's really entering uncharted territory here. Oh boy. Oh man, this is. I never studied. For this. For this. <laughs> I didn't do veterinary. Uh, is this enough? Uh, no, we need to go more. <laughs> you serious? Yeah, yeah, go, go, go. Go more? Yeah, we have, we have, I have my whole have, whole hand in there. Let me show you something really interesting. Yeah? Open your hand. Oh, you lost it. You just had a really big worm. Oh, look at it. I had a worm? This is oh, a whip that's worm. That's horrible. And what? And, and it is not going to attack you. If you are disgusted, I will do it. No, I'm not disgusted. I, no, I just don't want to go in all the way. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, but I've got my watch and everything, man. I can't. Take it off. <laughs> my God. Take it off. Okay. Oh boy. Oh man. I feel kind of weird I doing this. I ask you to take care of this. Oh man. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, this is how you do it properly. Oh, actually, she already defecated. Yeah, not very. Not very. There's nothing in there. Huh? Nevertheless, quite a lot of worms. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's enough. This is enough. This is also the perfect opportunity to get a blood sample from the horse. This is to do studies on the reproductive level of the animal. So actually, if she is pregnant in this moment or if she is not. To be able to do this thing, we have to take the serum out of the blood. That requires specialist equipment, which Ovidiu carries in his vehicle. The centrifuge will spin the test tube at high speed, yeah. separating out the blood serum, which can then be sent to the lab for testing. Okay, we will send it to Vienna to be tested for uh, the levels of progesterone and estrogen. Those are the main hormones from which you can know if the animal is pregnant or not. The sedative has worn off. The whole tranquilizing process and checkup has taken just over 90 minutes. And the mayor is none the wiser about the indignity of having both Robert and Ovidiu probe her for a fecal sample. Next, the Pristina sanctuary bears have a date with the dentist. <laughs> The Pristina Bear Sanctuary in Kosovo has now been operating for two years, providing a home for brown bears rescued from cruel, inhumane conditions. Open to the public, visitors can experience the bears in an environment close to their natural habitat. And they're starting to behave like bears living in the wild. Even though we, we prepared the dance for them, they had their own, they did their own uh, dance and they hibernated. And they hibernated for three months. The 13 restaurant bears that were first rescued are clearly much happier in the sanctuary. But many still suffer long-lasting effects from their previous lives and need to receive ongoing medical and dental treatment. I'm a human dentist, but uh, in my free time, I do some bigger patients. Dr. Luce and his wife Sabine are volunteers who make several trips a year to treat bears at a number of sanctuaries across Europe. Leading the medical team is wildlife veterinarian Johanna Pena. We don't work together that often, but like um, three times a year about for a long weekend. Yeah, we have bear holiday together. <laughs> 
treatments range from basic fillings to root canals and extractions. And how does a 300 kilogram brown bear feel about a dental appointment? I think it's sometimes a bit frustrating for a wildlife veterinarian when you uh, try to do your best uh, to keep your patients healthy, but every time you dart them, of course, they hate you. The first patient today is 16-year-old Ero. He was the largest of the five bears rescued from the final restaurant. He weighs about 300 kilogram. He's by far the biggest of all. Johanna prepares for the anesthesia based upon estimated measurements. For wildlife anesthesia, it's always a bit challenging to prepare it out because many things can go wrong, of course. We don't have a pre-anesthetic health check on the bear, so we cannot go there and um, see and check the, the blood values before we dart them. And then, of course, you can hit it at the wrong place. You aim for the big muscles in the shoulder, but what if he moves in, like, the second where you dart? Then you dart it into the lung, and that could be deathly. The anesthesia should take around 10 minutes to work, but Johanna wants to be absolutely certain Eros fully unconscious before allowing anyone to enter the cage. How many kilograms you say? Three. I say 340. Okay, middle. 325. <laughs> It's important Johanna gets an accurate weight. That way she knows how much of each drug is needed. How much? It means 325. Sauber? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Eros' legs are tied down to stop them flopping around during the procedure. If he were to wake, however, the ropes would do little to restrain him. Ich los machen, wenn ihr wollt. So we have a cavity in the tooth because of a broken tip, and here the same, the canine tooth severely broken, and with a cavity here. Broken teeth are common amongst captive bears. They bite on the bars of their enclosures, and under the load of their extremely powerful jaws, something has to give. So now I give here some local anesthesia, and then we will perform a root canal treatment. The tooth has to be uh, treated because the pulper is chronically infected. Now this causes maybe pain and uh, osteolysis. That means that the bone starts to be destroyed. Really big tooth, huh? Huge. While the root canal procedure is similar to that performed on a human, working on bears can create some tricky problems. Have we there still longer? It's going to be longer. It's the best to have. Yeah, that's not good. The difficulty is that the tooth is so extremely long. So now he's already in anesthesia for more than one hour. So we top up the anesthesia every so now and then, according to all these parameters. While Dr. Luce works, Johanna and Julia give Ero a full health check. Hair samples are taken to measure cortisone levels, which gives an indication of how much stress the bears endure. They'll be compared to samples taken when they were first rescued to find out how well the bears are rehabilitating in the sanctuary. The blood gases are all fine, like even after now he's almost three hours down. He has perfect values, perfect, it's really nice. Okay. Smooth and perfect. Good. With the root canal finished, Johanna can bring Ero back around. I'm drawing up the antidote so he can wake up faster, but I only give it when we are in. <laughs> the procedure has been a success. Any cavities and decay have been fixed, 
and the tests show Eero is in good health. Super, very good. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you to you. A special thanks. Around half an hour later, a slightly groggy Eero returns to his outside enclosure. Coming up, three very young additions to the Pristina Bear Sanctuary. And four paws working to win over the locals in the Danube Delta. Winter on the Danube Delta sees temperatures plummet to minus 20 degrees Celsius and even lower. The wild horses eat tree bark, roots and whatever they can find. But it's hard going and a significant number don't survive the winter. In the winter of 2010 and 2011, before the Four Paws program began, Locals say 50% of the herd died. Now, four paws provide food to help the horses through the winter. No matter what the weather is like, Ovidiu has the unenviable job of distributing the hay. He's also tasked with rebuilding a good relationship with the locals. The Four Paws intervention in 2011, which prevented the slaughter of 55 wild horses, came at a cost. Everybody was blaming the locals for being very, very uh, brutal with those animals. And when we returned back with them, we didn't have uh, them on our side. They were very, very, how to put, um, not violent in itself, but very against us, you know? They were really... They, they were like, aggressive they towards were, us. Yeah, 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 they were aggressive course, towards yeah. us. It's taken some time for Ovidiu and his team to earn back the trust of the locals. One of the ways they've done it is by offering veterinary services, treating their livestock and pets. He was run over by a car and his spine was injured, and that's why he cannot uh, run anymore, but they didn't want to leave him because he's a very good dog. And now we are trying now to put him uh, on a wheelchair. <laughs> In the beginning, people were reluctant. They didn't know exactly what we are doing. The concept of animal welfare was quite strange to, towards them. But now I think they understood that uh, what we are um, doing. Let's see if he goes. Another reason the locals have warmed to the presence of four paws is the financial spin-off of having a protected herd of wild horses in a spectacular setting. In the last four years, there was a very big development from the touristic point of view. So actually, now the locals gain a lot of money because people came to see the forest and the horses. With more and more locals starting to see the benefits arising from the work Ovidio and his team are doing on the Danube Delta, certainty is given to the future of these wonderful animals, Europe's last wild horses. It's two years since the Kosovo restaurant bears were rescued and moved to the Pristina Sanctuary, and they're thriving. 90% bears are vegetarians, so they eat fruit and vegetable. Everything that they can find in nature. With these small holes, we usually use small pieces of food that contains a lot of protein, like dog pellets and some flower seeds and our bears really like it a lot. With lunch served, the treasure hunt can begin. Mm -hmm. 
Doing it this way keeps the bears stimulated and encourages them to use their natural instinct for foraging. Since those first 11 restaurant bears came here, there have been another five bears rescued. In this enclosure here, we have three little cubs that we rescued last year. When we rescued them, they were only two months old and they were quite weak, actually. Kosovan authorities became aware of them after a family posted photos on Facebook of the tiny, three-week-old Emma living in their flat. A few days later, her brothers Ron and Oscar were found nearby. All three were undernourished and stressed. Normally, wild bear cubs spend at least two years with their mother, so they needed round-the-clock care. Five months later, with the cubs in good health, the Pristina team tried something they'd never done before. With the cubs still being young, there was a chance they could survive in the wild. Today we're moving them to um, Shari National Park um, because we've built a large enclosure for them, away from people, so that they can spend the next year or so getting used to being in, in their natural environment. They were left alone to forage for their own food with frequent checks to see how they were getting on. Unfortunately, the project ended after two months, following several encounters with people traveling in the national park. The cubs weren't wary enough around humans, and that would pose problems as they grew older and were released. Today, they share an enclosure at the sanctuary and will eventually be moved to a new, larger enclosure. Oscar is next in line for a checkup with the vets and dentist. Here is a milk dentition. Maybe the tooth uh, would fall out. Can you close the mouth, please, yeah. dear, dear patient? No, I don't think that will fall out. No. Yes, yeah. we have to take it out. One baby tooth we have to extract here. The time of changing of the teeth is over for him. And the tooth, the baby tooth, would stay there and would harm him. So, how are you going to go Aber das ist extrem hohl innen, glaube ich. Yeah. Hier ist Bescheid, was wegen Frakturen yeah, so. Yeah. So he extracted the remaining milk tooth. Here, this is uh, destroyed from the permanent tooth. Now we clean the wound a little bit, you see. Keeping a close eye on proceedings is Mustafa, who has a special relationship with Oscar. After they got confiscated, Mustafa was there day and night for many months. And the reason why they are alive is because Mustafa was working day and night. <laughs> He's kind of Papa Bear. <laughs> Good, so everything went well. Um, he became a really proper bear. He's still very small, but uh, compared to last year, it's a free, of course really nice to see him. But there's one more thing to do before Oscar is taken back to the enclosure. We should make a picture with Mustafa and Oscar. Come, Mustafa, go with Oscar. You and Oscar, your baby. Yeah. It's only through the work and love of Pristina staff like Mustafa, the skills and dedication of the medical and dental teams, and the support of Four Paws, that bears like Cassandra, Ero, and Oscar are able to live out their days with a good quality of life. And more importantly, all of that effort is helping change the way the people of Kosovo view an animal that for so long was simply a sideshow attraction. <laughs>